symbol of excellence in sports entertainment. Hello and welcome to Arn. This is Paul Bromwell, and today I'm joined by the Hall of Famer, the founder of the Whore Four Horsemen, the creator of the Spinebuster, the 1A tag team wrestling, your TV champion, and my tag team partner. He's double A. He's Arn Anderson. Arn, how are you this week, my friend? Wonderful, 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 wonderful. It's springtime. How about you? You like um, spring? I, you like springtime? I love, I love it. I love it. I love it. My uh, dad's birthday, March 20th. This show drops on the 23rd. So 71 years on this earth for my pops. So it's always uh, exciting when the first day of spring, his birthday. So I love this time of year. And uh, I also love, like you said last week, when it's brighter out at night, the temperatures are starting to warm up. And uh, it's just a great time of year. And what's exciting as I transition this you and Brock, what did, what did you call the tour that you guys were on last week? We called it the Spring Spectacular. Was that it? The Anderson Spring, Spring, Spring Spectacular. Spectacular, buddy. And listen, as this show drops March 23rd, you guys are getting ready for that big match. Uh, Brock is at West Davidson High School in Lexington, North Kagalaki. AML, you're back there uh attending that event. Sounds like it's going to be a fun one, Arn, and another opportunity, as you like to say, for Brock to get those reps in. Um, so talk about this one a little bit, Arn. I know you're excited for it. Well, let's just say there's going to be another Anderson. I'm not talking about Brock. Uh, enter into the fray, and I'll leave it at that. Okay? I know, I, I know exactly where you're heading with that. So the Anderson family will be a little larger uh, on this day as the show drops. Uh, we also talked about last week, you guys are going back to Indianapolis, Indiana, and I shouldn't say going back for the first time, right? Squared Circle Expo. You're really excited about that show. Well, and before that, after the, oh, the Charlotte show, Saturday night, you know, we're going to do the thing. Lexington's not very far up the road. We're going to come home, sleep a little bit, and then we're going to get down there bright and early for the Charlotte Comic Con. It's called the Heroes Comic Con. So, Getting to do one of those right here at home is awesome. And and you know what? It's aptly named Heroes because you know, a lot of fans are going to get to meet their hero in Double A, and you're going to what have with you a couple things in hand. We might as well talk about it right now. Not only are you going to have that comic book, My Life as Arn Anderson, the My Life as the Enforcer, but you're also going to have those hats. One white, one black. We're going to have a plenty of those on Alma. The more important thing is my life story. There it is. You're, for all those over the years that asked when you're going to write another book, there it is. And I hope it, it uh, tests, tests out with the audience and everyone enjoys it and they get something from it. And there's some things in there that surprise and shock them and there's some things that uh, they remember, uh, maybe not 100% why things happen, and this will clear it up. It's all can be found right there in that book, so check it out. Also, you can pre-order on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. That way you have copy in hand uh, when you're ready to meet Arn and have him sign it. If not, no worries. He has copies with him as well, so definitely make sure you check him out there. And then, as I was saying, the 29th and 30th that weekend, you'll be in Indianapolis. Then you're going to WrestleCon April 4th through 7th in Philly. You guys really are on a spring spectacular tour. I love it. Well, and the 23rd, that show in uh, Lexington, keep in mind, we'll be there a couple hours early, signing books, pictures, taking pictures with you guys, anything you want. We'll, we'll be there to uh, mingle. And if you don't get to go to a show and you want it to one of those cool hats the arm was just showing, you can easily do that, boxthegimmicks.com, and check out all the hats, the T-shirts I'm wearing. I, I finally broke out of my sweatshirts, and I'm now putting back the T-shirts back on, Arn, for our recording as it's warming up. You have that nice Four Horsemen shirt on, that logo uh, that Dominic helped design. Beautiful T-shirt. So check it out. Get your merch. Get your Horseman hats and uh, everything over there. Again, I say it each and every week. You guys... 
kick-ass support in the show and uh, Arn Anderson and Four Horsemen uh, merchandise. It's all there. No one else has it, and if they do, they're a ripoff. It's not real. It doesn't count. It's bullshit. Get the real shit at boxofgimmicks.com. Am I right, Arn, or what? The real horseman shit. That's right. That's right. Signed off by Double A himself, Arn Anderson, so check it out. And uh, with the obligatory shilling out of the way, let's get to the reasons our fans are here, and that is to continue to walk through your illustrious career, Arn. And last week we discussed October 1994. We talked about your match with Dustin and how you guys all left him laying at the end. Hulk successfully defends his title against Flair in a career-threatening match only to be confronted uh, by brother Brutai. Brutai immediately, he then joins um, Kevin Sullivan and Avalanche, formerly Earthquake in WWF. They are now known as the Three Faces of Fear. And before we move any further, let's talk about some factions, something that you know a thing or two about, Arn, in your career. You're the founder of the Horseman. You're one of the foundational pieces of the Dangerous Alliance. Uh, most recently, uh, up to this point, the stud stable. And, and here we have Brutai, who we now call the Butcher. Mm, love the creative on that. He's taken the lead role in a faction with Sullivan and Avalanche at his side. First thoughts. I mean, we're going way back to 94. When you hear this, this faction, uh, what do you think about the makeup of this group, the guys that are making up this group? Uh, what do you think just on the, on the surface about the three faces uh, of fear here? Um, it feels like it was just thrown together. Factions that get over, have a reason for guys to be together. There has to be, some common sense reasoning why guys pool their talents together. And when you just throw a group of guys together and, okay, here's what we have and here's what you call them, it's hard for the uh, fans to get invested in something like that. I think. It is, and it's almost like they're putting together, outside of Kevin Sullivan, when you think about Brutus, I'm just going to call him Brutus Beefcake, Brutus. That's how I grew up on him. And John Tenta, they're old school guys from the WWF days. And and it's a hot topic with Dave Meltzer. He he actually shared some thoughts around this too. It's like you're kind of rehashing some of the past. Again, guys comfortable with Hogan. And Meltzer said, although we although we may be surprised, the next clash and pay-per-view don't look to be winners. The fact is the real test of Hogan's drawing power has yet to begin. He's absolutely right. Of course, Hogan versus Flair, it's that unique dream match that's going to draw a lot of interest. It's a no-brainer. Uh, to your point, Arn, you have said it over. I would have saved that one or invested more time in it. The Hogan era is when Flair is gone and Hogan feeds himself his old WWF, again, Meltzer's words, cronies. He used to eat for lunch and shoots angles with them where he puts himself in a vulnerable position. Something for reasons in hindsight everyone should be able to figure out that he would never do for flair, but he'll only do that if he's in full control. And listen, we know that Meltzer's will and always will be a Ric Flair guy and has a long track record of being critical, super critical of Hogan, but he does have a valid point here. The stalwart flair gone from the company. And now you're seeing Hulk from our perspective as fans retread that 1980s booking that brought him so much success when he was with McMahon. So in your opinion, Arn, I got to ask, do you think pandering to Hogan is a mistake here or does the box office appeal he brings to the company offset some of the damages that the eighties booking philosophy might bring to the product? Oh, the only way to benefit a guy working with Hogan is he needs to have heat. I can't remember and put my finger on anybody who would have had heat at that particular time. Is there anybody you can think of? No. With the company that was hot, say a Rick Rude that would have been hot at the time. Yeah. You could have put, you know, you could have put him in in an angle done properly with Hogan. I think it's got to be, you know. I don't know. It's just booking matches. You can book matches 
this guy against this guy, this guy against this guy. And you can put it in a town. It doesn't mean it's going to draw, but you can have two or three matches that the audience cares about. And sometimes that's enough to draw you a house. I, uh, it, it was just all rehash, you know? Yeah. And Meltzer does make a good point because he's talking about Hogan's contract that's due to expire before the end of the year. Obviously, we know Hogan sticks around, but Meltzer's point was, where does the company go uh, to Sting? That day, in Meltzer's mind, had long passed. Sting was the shining star of 88. This is 1995, and although he saw on the card, Sting was not a factor for the record pay-per-view at Bash at the Beach. He wasn't even on the, uh, wasn't on the card. Um as far as not a factor for that pay-per-view has no effect on the clash rating was only at the last show for a cameo sting was if he had potential to be the man to carry the company profitably the ball was dropped many years ago uh, again this is all coming from Meltzer, and they tried several times in each case backing out because it wasn't working yet he is not only the best choice but the only choice should hogan not come to terms there is no star who can be a franchise in that company today and confusing a big crowd reaction uh, with someone's ability to carry business on top is something the company needs to be able to differentiate. So what's the solution if Hogan leaves? A highly publicized, totally new direction, repeating the same mistakes is only going to throw more good money after bad. But that, that's pretty. That's some stiff criticism, in my opinion, of Sting from Meltzer. You've spoken about Sting over and over again. All things being equal, do you think, hey, if needed to, we could the, the company could have gotten back behind Sting and really pushed him to the moon and stars again? Of course I could. You could have revived him. You know, it wasn't like he was dead. Right. The audience just realized the company was stepping aside for a minute. We're going to go this Hogan thing, see how it works out. If he can do it on his own, great. Uh, but by no means was Sting dead. He just was hadn't been in the right angles and being pushed. What would have been wrong with Sting stepping up to Hogan? And could you imagine if Bischoff would have gotten behind Sting the same way he did Hulk? I'm talking about what he could have looked like if the resources and the same commitment level behind someone like the character of a Sting. Again, we're armchair quarterback here uh, at this show but to your point sting even to just up until his retirement you want to talk about a guy that uh fans are passionate about love can't wait to support he came back as the crow he absolutely from a fan perspective if bischoff would have had that same kind of you know again commitment resources etc been a star here you know, it's just all, again, it's Monday morning quarterback and what if, what if, what if. You know, you could have, if you look at the way things, you know, shook out and Sting just now retired, you know, and he's been everywhere he went. He has been a force. He has been the guy. He has been over, stayed over his entire career. What if he would have stepped up after the flare match thinking Flair might have been gone. He went, good, good for you. But guess what? This is my company. You're the outsider, not me. And put the onus and let Stain go on the attack and let him bow up to Hogan. Let him show, and not done in a hill way, done in his way. Yeah. Because he was the guy, he was the figurehead of the company. The franchise versus the new face. Of the company. There it is. Oof. I, uh, you know, and, and, and while we're here, because we didn't get to talk about it last week, uh, thoughts and comments on Sting's retirement? Um, I think it was what he envisioned. He p plugged his two kids in, which I thought was innovative, you know, and he had earned to have the fact of having his night go exactly like he imagined it. He's earned that. 40 years, guys. God Almighty. If you've given to this business 40 years of your life and went home and had to have your wife put you back together any number of times, help you get up off the couch, and help you get out of bed, and help you 
step in the shower, all the things that, that your family does to support you at 40 years, you should be able to picture your retirement in whatever company you're working for. And thank God he was working for AEW because Tony pretty much just said, Hey, how do you see it? I'm sure. How do you see it staying? And Sting told him and he went, that's what we'll do. Mm. And, and I'm very, very happy for him. I'm glad. Yeah, no, that's great. This episode of The Arn Show is sponsored by Blue Chew. Let's talk about sex, guys. Remember the days when you were always ready to go? Now you can increase your performance and get that extra confidence in bed at bluechew.com. Isn't that right, Arn? One thing I found out the hard way is that aging does no jobs. You will not win in the war with aging. But prior to this, there was no option on how to fix it. You just had to suffer with it. I'm going to go the rest of my life. No sex. But, but Blue Chu said, no, that's probably not the way we're going to go about this. And we're not going to charge you $60 a pill. We're going to make it affordable. We're going to make it work. And you can take your beat up old body and turn it into a sex machine. Oh, that's right, Arn. Blue Chew is the hot tag you didn't know you need, but you want it. And my God, now you know you need it. Listen, it's so easy. It's that unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra, but it's in chewable form and it's simple. Bluechew.com. We love simple things, don't we, Arn? Yeah, man. Don't make it hard. Well, do make it hard. <laughs> I almost said the wrong thing. Yeah. We don't want to make it hard on you to make it hard. No, we want to make it simple to do so to get it hard. And listen, when you head over to bluechew.com, you're going to talk to one of their licensed medical providers. And once you're approved, you're going to get a prescription within days. And the best part, it's all done online. There's no weird, awkward visits to the doctor's office. No strange conversations. No waiting in line at the pharmacy. So let's tell you how to do it. we got a special deal for our listeners. You can try Blue Chew free when you use our promo code ARN at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com promo code ARN to receive your first month free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and safety info. It's bluechew.com promo code ARN. And you will be in heaven, my friends, back in the game with Blue Chew. We want to thank Blue Chew for supporting the Arn Show. And make sure you use that promo code Arn. That's right, bluechew.com, promo code Arn. Thanks for sharing that with us. So we'll move on from that discussion surrounding Hulk and the big change and and all that. And I want to talk about another major change, and that involved you uh, and we, we were laughing about it towards the end of last week's episode, but your addition to the booking committee where you're now sitting at the round table, who approached you? Do you remember this? Uh, what was your initial response? Were you flattered, nervous? Did you see booking as something in your future? Maybe at this point, um, well, I want to hear Rick, about this. One. Well, Rick brought me in. He brought me in to, to be part of the, the booking hey. Committee, yeah. and then <laughs> he loses his match and he takes off. <laughs> so, okay, all right, I want you to come in. You know, da, da 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 da. You're a smart guy. I want you to lend your expertise. You can help me. You can help Kevin. You know, you guys are great idea guys. And then he left, and that left me and Kevin and Jimmy Hart sitting in there. We were the booking committee. Um, so I was learning on the job, but, but basically what I offered and the reason that he brought me in is, is I had a way with finishes, making stuff make sense, things of that nature. I could be the, <clears throat> maybe considered myself the voice of reason, you know, in a crazy business where, where you do a lot of haywire stuff. Somebody had to be there to reel you back in and go, hey, wait a minute. That might be a little too far. How about this? And that's where you, uh, to me, you have to bring so much value and still could to this day to an organization (laughs) is what you just said right there. 
bringing them back in, bringing them back. Uh, you said the haywire and the craziness that can go on in creative and booking, but having that mind for wrestling and the business that you have had to be able to say, Hey guys, let's, let's, let's reel that, that, that back in here. We're, we're, we're a little far out in, in the water, man. That's, that's so good. And, and our first question of the week comes from the professor drew Landry and drew said, did you enjoy booking and did it give you another perspective on the business? I didn't necessarily enjoy it because it just meant more hours at the office. You know, I got to remember now I'm still wrestling and I'm still wrestling in a spot the last three matches of the night, every night. So if I went to a house show, I would be responsible for going around, laying out all the finishes for the entire show and putting my match together as well which I could have been on last that night or second to the last or third to the last, but I still had to be available for questions, people wanting to make changes, all those things that go on during the show. And I've still got a main event match or at least a top match to wrestle. So <clears throat> Let, let's get into it though, because your at least the next few weeks are about to change for you. November the 25th, all, it's Albany, Georgia. Okay. How Rome, Georgia, and Albany. No idea. How far away is, is Albany from Rome? <clears throat> Probably 250 miles. All right. So 250 miles away from where you grew up. You and Bunkhouse Buck, you wrestle Dusty and Dustin in a steel cage match. It closes the show. Dusty and Dustin win the match. But on during this match, it was reported that you blew out your knee. Do you have any recollection of that match, that injury? It sidelines you for a couple of weeks. I say weeks because you end up wrestling again on December the 13th. So it was less than three full weeks that you were out. But again, uh, you sustained a knee injury here. It was just uh, meniscus torn. And uh, that's not a major something that you necessarily have to have surgery. You can rehab it back. So after a couple of weeks off, that's all. Yeah. Yeah. You've told us before wrestlers have to be built differently and the body seemingly built up calluses because the number of high impact bumps, buddy, that you took during the course of this match, even though it almost sounds ridiculous, does that continued bumping and resistance that you developed to bumps over the years help you, you think like overcome some of these injuries or how to deal with these injuries better? You just don't get hurt as much. Hmm. You know, the main thing is control the bumps that you could control. You know, it, it's, it's, if you put your hands, your, your, give your body to somebody and they're not equipped to do whatever it is you guys are attempting to do, <clears throat> it's too late once you figure out, well, I'm going to power bomb this guy, but I'm not strong enough. And he didn't help me enough to get him all the way up. I just get him halfway up and guess what? I'm not strong enough to muscle him the rest of the way. And you end up dropping a guy on his shoulder yeah. or whatever. That's how easy it is to get hurt. You don't intend to hurt anybody or injure right. them, but that's how easy it happens. And, um, a meniscus will heal itself. You just got to stay off of it for a little while. And, you know, your body just gets used to taking bumps and taking abuse. And every night, you know, the part that no one sees is you come back, you get a ice pack and you wear it to the next hotel that you're going to. However long that is, because ice is a healer and it's a miracle medicine. And, uh, you know, we're our own doctors, we're quack chiropractors adjusting each other and all those things. But you know what? It worked to the degree that it kept us on the road because that getting hurt was not an option. Being yeah. off for months was not an option. If there went your angle, if you had worked your way into being next to last, you had a nice angle going and you get hurt and you go away for four months. Guess what? But when you get back, something has replaced you. And it's just a different mentality. So I wouldn't do a catch me up top, grab me by the nuts, grab me by the throat, throw me off sure. to the floor. 
what's an everyday occurrence would have never happened back then because I'm looking down there and I'm going, <clears throat> boy, it's, you know, humid in this building. It sure looks slick down there. How am I going to land and protect myself? Well, you'd make a conscious decision to pull it, do something else because you can't control it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I want to talk about Jimmy Golden and you taking on Dusty and Dustin. Looking back on that now, that's pretty cool that you got to have an experience like that, working tag matches with Jimmy Golden against Dusty and Dustin. He's great. He's Jimmy Golden's a great worker. Buckhouse Buck, great worker. Yeah. And uh, how cool was the story with Dustin and Dusty? You know, oh, People were commenting on that, and by the way, on social with his promo, left and right. I mean, come on, the walk behind her. Nobody else on earth could have cut that promo, made that better. Nobody. Dustin shared. He shared on, on uh, reposted off your tweet, off your show, uh, off the show about that promo. And I thought that was really cool. What he uh, said? Yeah, he, he just had a couple. He just just like it. Yeah, you know, he actually had a comment about it. I have to go back and look and see what it was. But it was something that I was like, oh, wow. He, uh, he you know, was tagged in the clip. He reposted it and made a comment about how, just how special it was. Yeah. He knew he was in the middle of something that would last for generations. Yeah. You know, if we're all still here 20 years from now, people will still be pointing back, pulling that, that promo up and going here. You want to go to school? Sit down right here and watch this. Yeah. Or I hope, I hope they do. Yeah. If the schools aren't showing that one, <laughs> one of the examples, they should be when it comes to promo class. Yeah. So. But because, you know, something like that only happens once in, in a lifetime. Absolutely. That wasn't a promo. That was a guy speaking from his heart. Absolutely. Well, Arn, uh, the next topic I wanted to cover for this month, WCW fired Ricky Steamboat, who was unable to compete. We talked about the back injury that he suffered in a match with uh, Steve Austin in August at the Clash of Champions. But Ricky's wrestled a handful of matches in the 30 years since. But you told us, what a loss this was for the company. Did you know if the company had ever offered Steamboat a different position? I asked because it seems like WCW would want to do anything they could to keep a guy like Steamboat involved or on the roster or something. There wasn't that. <clears throat> I don't think there was a acceptance in the office of of every wrestling company for that matter of just how valuable that knowledge that Ricky had, how you could step outside of, of being a wrestler and become a teacher, you know, and uh, he might not have at the time, if he, if it's a back and he's still making the towns, he's not going to heal up. And maybe that injury was worse than what we thought. And he had to go home and heal up, you know, but yeah, you know, I know that that he was uh, when I was with WWF, obviously, and Ricky was a producer for a while. <laughs> and I saw how the young kids responded to the things that he was teaching them, the selling and and all those things that that he was so good at. You could just tell those kids were were gaining a lot of knowledge from Ricky. But uh, the timing, I think, was you know. You hurt your back in this business. You still got to walk airports and you still got to sit and rent a cars. You still got to do a lot of things that are not favorable to you healing up and getting well. Yeah. Yeah. No, we, uh, we had a couple of fan questions about the dragon and his departure. Dylan uh, says, this is the month and year I was born, sir. November 94 month and year Dylan was born. Hey, happy birthday back to you back in, in 94, November, Dylan. He said with Ricky steamboat being fired, did you think WCW could have ever found another pure baby face like him again? Who fired him? Uh, I don't I, remember that. Been been there. I mean, yeah. I mean, firing Ricky steamboat is uh, that I don't remember. That was yeah, part of the storyline. No, nah, he was just, he was fired. Like uh, he couldn't wrestle anymore. So they, here's the door. Yeah. Huh. Uh, Jeff, not coaching this season. Fisher, <laughs> Jeff Fisher says, uh, if you think that Ricky steamboat was at his most effective when chasing a heel for a top level singles title, it seems that the fans were not as invested in him when he started working tags or in feuds with the lower mid card. What say you are? do you think that's where steamboat was most effective? 
Yep, as a single challenger who would go back and watch his matches, he would sell, 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 but he was always in the fight. And that was his drawing a building. You knew that he would never quit. So no matter how bad he was hurt and how much he was selling, you knew he was still in the fight. Arn, let's talk about somebody that is on his way in to WCW. And uh, that would be WCW negotiating with none other than the macho man, Randy Savage. Oh, yeah. Sorry, guys. I won't do that again. Uh, Vince had relegated Savage to the role of color commentator earlier in the year, but Randy believed he still had gas in the tank. Obviously, we saw that he did. Savage and McMahon agreed to part ways. Vince thought so much of Randy Savage that he even bid him farewell on the November 7th, 1994 episode of Raw. Uh, Savage began immediately working a deal with the help of Hogan, and he debuted on WCW Saturday night, December 3rd, 1994. And listen, we're going to discuss his debut on um, what it meant for the company uh, next when we get to December next, uh, because he's now involved in the road to Starcade. But I want to get your thoughts. What did you think about Randy Savage coming in? Who did he debut against? He would debut. Uh, I don't have who his, his challenger was, just that it was Saturday night, December 3rd, 19. Go ahead. Was it you? Yes. Okay. I and love that I, you remember that too. That's that's well, awesome. If I remember correctly, he uh, he came in. His first match was was I the TV champion at that time? No, uh, you weren't. And I know that because you were just coming off the knee injury. And I'm going to look it up as we're talking here just to see if I can find out about that card. Yep. So it first appeared on the edition of Sa Savage made it clear from his first promo that he'd be world champion again. And uh, let me see if I can see if it shows who the match was against. Um, I'll look for it here while we continue to talk here. But uh, what did you think about Savage coming in overall? I was excited. I knew what a story was. I'd been up there and, you know, I, uh, during his heyday when he was probably his hottest was when I was up there and, uh, he could go. I mean, he could still go. I knew he still had something in the tank. Well, that's for sure. And he definitely did. And I'll, and I'll find that for sure on, on that one, but we know some of his greatest success was when he was tied to Hogan as either the half of the mega powers or as Hulk's opponent. But, man, they had a, a complicated relationship over the years. But it seemed like they were always still able to figure out how to do business together. Uh, was this your experience from, from the outside kind of watching Hulk and Randy and their relationship? Did uh, you know? I think he's in the category of a Hogan guy. Uh, wouldn't you agree? A Hogan guy? You mean being part of his clique? Yeah, just being part of, hey, you know, here comes Hogan. And here comes another guy that would be considered a Hogan guy and macho man kind of falling under that umbrella. Um, I don't know if I would say he was a Hogan guy. You got to remember they weren't on guaranteed money when he, they were with WWF. So when they were working their angles together, even though I had personal issues and that I'm, I'm pretty sure they didn't like each other very much but they were dependent on their living was dependent on each other. So they were businessmen, bell to bell. They did what they had to do um, because they wanted to get paid and they were both making a heap of money. They absolutely were. And he had that slim Jim deal, by the way, uh, that was going to pay for him when he came to WCW, Brad Stanton, he's back this week. And he'd like to know if you were surprised that the WWE thought Macho Man was at the end of his in-ring career. The WWF thought that? Yeah, they thought that he was at the end of his career as far well, as an in-ring performer. Were you surprised at that? I think, no, not really. You know, it's a young man's business. And mm -hmm. every so, every 10 years or so, you got to have a turnover with the, you know, with the young guys. You just have to. You have to keep feeding, feeding the business. And, uh, I could see Vince, you know, looking at Randy because, you know, once you've seen something, the same, same stick, same act for four or five years, unless you're really something over the top special, you know, people move to the younger guys. They just want that evolution of the business. 
Nick Lenz wants to know if you have any interesting stories about Randy Savage. He says, from what I've heard, he was one of the best in-ring workers that the WWF, WWE had in their main events. I never had the chance uh, to meet him, unfortunately, before he passed away. So any interesting stories on uh, on Macho? Well, he was just, uh, he was crazy about Liz. I mean, it drove it to the point of it was like, he was so protective. It was psychotic almost, yeah. you know, it, it's like you would see him walking down the hall, going from the locker room to say the interview set or something backstage, you know, and you would see him walking or you could just see Randy, his head was on a swivel to see if anybody looked at Liz. And if he interpreted that they did, he would stop and go and let them have it. Don't be looking at Liz. <laughs> and he was just so over overprotective of her. He just smothered her death, and it just. Well, Liz would still be within earshot and hear him saying that, right? Oh yeah, yeah, wow. yeah. I mean, you know, you can imagine how that. You know, she was genuinely a nice person. You can you, just imagine yeah. how that made her feel. She's going, "Oh God, these people have got to hate both of us." <laughs> right. You know? They're going to be afraid to talk to her. To her. Well, yeah. Know? I mean, everybody yeah. was. Nobody God. talked to her. They, he put her off in a locker room by herself and she would sit there till their, their gig was up and somebody would go get her along with Randy and they go straight to the ring. I just read a report that America is now in more credit card debt than ever before. More than $1.1 trillion. You know, my grandfather used to say there's no stress like money stress, son. Well, are you feeling that right now? Let me help. You've got a friend in the mortgage business and me, and I've helped families just like yours save hundreds of dollars a month. Seriously, we've helped listeners to this podcast save up to 800 bucks a month. At SaveWithConrad.com, we routinely help our podcast listeners consolidate all of their high interest rate credit cards into just one much lower monthly payment. Would you like to lower your monthly payments? Wouldn't it be nice to skip your next two house payments? Are you finally ready for some breathing room and peace of mind? Start saving money today with your friend in the mortgage business, me at savewithconrad.com. You don't need perfect credit. You don't need money out of your pocket. And if we can't help you save some cash, we won't waste your time. You see at savewithconrad.com, we don't say no. We say not yet, but here's how. We want to be your mortgage advisor for life. So find out how easy it is to finally get rid of your credit card debt once and for all, get a much lower monthly payment, and even skip your next two house payments. Let's find out how much money you can save for free at savewithconrad.com. And number 32416, equal housing lender, savewithconrad.com. So I, I found out, uh, thanks to the research guy, he said the December 3rd, he actually just did a promo that night uh, for WCW Saturday night. He wouldn't wrestle until after Starcade that year. So at some point, you would wrestle him, I'm sure, no doubt about it. But that first night, he just ended up doing a promo. Okay. Uh, Maybe it, is it possible I had his first match on TV? It's possible. It's possible. I swear, I think, unless I dreamed it, that's what it was, and it was – I was the TV champion and like after the 20 minutes was up or whatever it was for the TV title, he ended up beating me right in the middle. But it, and the, the rules of the TV title was if you didn't do it inside, whatever the time limit was, then I remained champion. Okay. Well, listen, Hey, we're certainly going to discuss macho man during some upcoming shows, but let's shift gears one more time to clash of champions 29. The event takes place November 16th, 1994, Jacksonville, Florida at the Jacksonville Coliseum, 4,000 fans are in attendance and the readers of the wrestling observers are, were not fans. They gave it 80, 88% of the readers gave the overall show a thumbs down. You're not on the card. That's the reason why. Of course. Uh, Colonel, Colonel Parker comes out during the tag match between the Patriot and Bagwell and pretty wonderful and announced that you and Buckhouse Buck will be challenging the winner of that match for the tag team titles. Bagwell and the Patriot win the match, setting up the match with you and Buck for Saturday night. So we have that. The show also saw the debut as uh, with Sherry with Harlem Heat as their manager. And in a production mistake, the graphics showed Harlem Heat accompanied by Sherry, even though she hadn't been revealed yet as the mystery oh. manager. 
who, who they had been talking to on the flip phone for several weeks. Arn, we know we that we love the pairing of Sherry with Harlem Heat. What did Sherry provide a tag team like Harlem Heat? What were they missing that she just kind of added that extra oomph to that team? Ghetto. Yeah. They were all three ghetto. She was perfect fit for that. She knew perfect. what she was doing, man. She was so good. She's a vicious chick. Tough. Tough as nails. What a pro. She really, really was. I mean, sweetheart, back behind the curtain, buddy, when she came to that curtain, she'd beat up half the guys in the audience. She, uh, and she, by the way, we talked about Dark Side of the Ring last week to wrap up the show. She's going to have her own episode this season. So I'm looking forward to seeing that one for sure. Awesome. Yeah. The match of the night sees Vader defeat Dustin Rhodes in just shy of 12 minutes. A lot of back and forth action. Dustin hit that top rope lariat on Vader. Race interferes in the match, providing enough of a distraction that Vader mauled Dustin to hit him with the power bomb for the ending. Vader went for the Vader bomb off the middle rope. But, ho oh, Hacksaw Jim Duggan makes the save. And this sets up a match between the two for the U.S. title at Starcade. Dustin and Vader, what do, you, what do you think about that pairing, hearing about those two guys mixing it up in the ring? Dustin and Vader? Yeah. Vader would have been smart enough to sell for Dustin. It sounds like, to me on paper, I'd want, I want to see, I'm here all day for a Dustin and Vader match. Competitive. I'm yeah. sure it was competitive, and Leon was smart and had... You know, because once you just guzzle Dustin, then you lose faith in him. You got nothing to work with. Yeah. Uh, Arn, let's get into why we titled this episode. Hulk booked this shit. We have the eye with an asterisk. We're getting into the main event. The reason that the title, as we said, the title of this episode, we talked about it last week as reported by the history of the WWE WCW world champion, Hulk Hogan with Jimmy Hart. Sting and Dave Sullivan defeated the Butcher, Kevin Sullivan, and Avalanche in 11 minutes when Hogan pinned Sullivan after Mr. T, the guest referee for the bout, hit Sullivan with Hart's megaphone as Sullivan attempted to hit Hogan with it. Hogan and Dave wore Sting face paint for the bout. Dave Sullivan was helped backstage at the three-minute mark after sustaining an injury after the bout. Sullivan, Butcher, and Avalanche would lay out Hogan, Sting, and Mr. T, with the Butcher eventually putting the sleeper on Hogan. Moments later, Brad and Brian Armstrong, WCW Tag Champions, Alexander Bagwell and the Patriot, attempt to make the save but were beaten down as well. Butcher finally releases the hold on Hogan after police officers come ringside. This match, Arn, was used as a storytelling device, and normally that's okay, but there's a lot of gaga, as the late Pat Patterson would say. Dave's injured early. You got to get him out of the match. Then you got Mr. T using a megaphone as the special guest referee. The heels get the heat back with the butcher using a sleeper and Shivani overselling the hold as if we were indeed witnessing a murder on live television. And this is what sets up the main event for Starcade 94, which is Hulk Hogan versus his former best friend or his you know, the butcher back behind the scenes, best friend. And we're going to talk about that dumpster fire of a main event and the fallout during our December, 1994 episode. But very quickly, the booking is clearly for Hogan and it's very apparent. He has incredible influence over the direction. Creative control. Oh, it's not even a conversation. It's what do you want to do? Nobody's had it before him and nobody's had it since. Creative control means whatever he wants to do, that's what you do. And that's on the company by allowing that to happen. But, and, and here's the other thing too, I'm thinking about Mr. T and yes, I know contractually he had, you know, when he signed to do it was, it was for two, you know, for whatever, a couple appearances, but here he is again as another special referee for, a, you know, he just did it for, for flair. Are we overdoing it now with some of this stuff? Yes. Yeah. It meant nothing. It meant nothing. It meant absolutely nothing. He meant nothing to this business. Right. It was just Period. all hoping for that celebrity rub or that. Yeah. Smoke and, and mirrors. He was a celebrity at this point. How long had that his TV show been off the air when he did this? 
Oh, oh yeah. We're, this is 94 A team probably went off the air in what? 86, 87. I can't remember. I was a huge fan, but yeah, in the eighties. Irrelevant. You know, his, his claim to fame was Rocky three, whenever that was. Yeah. And well, his body, his body yeah. didn't look like it looked in Rocky three when he worked was the referee for us. No, absolutely. So listen, finally setting up this match with, uh, the butcher, these guys have a history WCW audience, not necessarily familiar with the depth of the relationship between these two behind the scenes. And the company did very little to stress the importance and significance of their relationship. Plus so much of it was seen in WWF. These are the same two men, Arn, who headlined SummerSlam taking on the macho King in Zeus. Ah, uh, so that, oh, he was rotten. Zeus. Yeah. He couldn't work at all either. The Observer published the following. The show was the first real test of the Hogan era minus Ric Flair. While losing Flair hurt the quality of the show, that was a given going in. We already knew that. The real question was, uh, to the, the answer was going to be answered by the ratings. The Clash drew a 3.6 rating and 5.4 share for 2.2 million homes. Last year's Clash drew 3.3 rating for Flair versus Vader, which, throwing the Hogan factor out of the equation, was a stronger main event. Nevertheless, the rating was not the bomb that many predicted with Flair out of the picture temporarily and Hogan in a six-man tag against the dreaded three faces of fear, a match which included Kevin and Dave Sullivan in the headline spot, which could have only dragged the appeal down again. Dave Meltzer's comments, not mine. The show drew 4,000 fans live, 3,200 paid, $38,000 gate. And uh, they had to move the crowd entirely to one side of the building and only shot that side of the building to make it look good for TV. So no matter how much we want to shit on this Clash of the Champions, no matter what we think, once again, Clash draw, draws a rating with over 2 million viewer, viewers while delivering less than I would say is really good professional wrestling arn. And, uh, I got to ask, what did you see in the coming year? What did, at this point, as I'm reading some of this stuff and going through some of the, the action that was happening, are, are you thinking that WCW pretty much relied too heavily on Hulk Hogan just to sell the product and get people to watch the show? And, and then, you know, some of the silliness of the booking was going on here. Well, the reality is clash of champions was free TV. Wasn't a pay-per-view. It's a big difference in asking somebody to pay 30, what was it, 34 99 or whatever it was. Absolutely. And watching a show that's prime time and free. That's the difference. But when you're on top and you get that number, you get the credit for it. Yeah. So that, that's how Hogan sold his drawing power. Right. Was, hey, check the numbers, brother. Still doing a little bit better than we did last year with Flair and Vader. So there you and go. There was, and there was nobody in a position to say, hey, it was a free show. Yes, everybody was home. Everybody watched it because it was prime time. It's not like a pay-per-view on Sunday where you're asking somebody to pay 35 bucks for it. They, uh, we, we have Adam Krasnoff with a question before we conclude our coverage. She said during this time, there wasn't a pay-per-view every month. So it was typical to have a clash of the champions between the gaps. Did wrestling on a clash of the champions feel just as special Arn, as wrestling on a pay-per-view? Uh, why or why not? Every bit. Cause she, cause she had a lot of eyes. Yeah. And if you were a pro, you knew a lot of eyes are going to see this. I got a chance. I'm going to. Not in a time crunch. I'm going to have enough time. Let's go tear it down. Arm, well, before we get out of here, we have two questions from longtime listener Brian Haremza concerning shows that were canceled during this month. First question The traditional Thanksgiving show at the Omni was canceled due to low ticket sales. The advertised main event of the show, Hulk versus Rick for the title. Does it surprise you that the Omni show was canceled? Or was interest just not there for Hulk Hogan in that area of the country? I'll never know how that could have even happened. Here's the entire card ready for that night. WCW TV championship, Johnny B. Bad against Honky Tonk. WCW tag champions, Marcus Bagwell and the Patriot versus Pretty Wonderful again, Orndorff and Roma. Sting and Dave Sullivan 
versus Avalanche and Kevin Sullivan, new U.S. champion Jim Duggan versus Steve Austin, and Dusty and Dustin versus Arn and Bunkhouse Buck in a steel cage. And that show got canceled for lack of ticket sales. Well, you said it off one of the matches. Pretty whoever, pretty, pretty wonderful, pretty wonderful, was wrestling. You said again. Yes, some That's of these one, matches we've seen before. I don't think you even knew what you said. There's one reason. Johnny and, Bad and Honky Tonk. We'd seen them again before, and nobody had any heat. And they had already beaten Buck and I. We didn't qualify as a main event. Yeah, I should have been third from the last. Brian also asked, he said, WCW attempted to run Madison Square Garden this month. Oh, This show is inevitably canceled. With Hulk Hogan on the roster, do you think WCW could have succeeded in the New York market? Or do you think, man, even with the popularity of Hulk, it has it is not to that level in the Northeast at this point. I, I bet it wasn't ever booked. Hogan, or uh, Vince has an exclusive on the card. I thought so, too. So maybe it, it also got held up in those... Maybe they attempted to book the show yeah. and they just, there was a short window when it was talked about and Vince wrote, Hey, we got an exclusive with you. They're not coming in here. And they went, you're right. And that was the cancellation. It was never open to WCW. Yeah. It never became a thing. Definitely and then got the, canceled. Years, the nitro years, you never saw them in the garden either. No, because he's got an exclusive. It's the only wrestling show that can be in that building. Well, arm buddy with that. We've come to the end. November 1994, Hulk booked himself and his friends, and as a result, is less than uh, it's less than I should say for a hardcore wrestling fan for sure. But the ratings tell us that he's still a draw. So I don't know, but that's, to me, that's only going to last so long until until people start seeing through your product. Next week, we call a timeout, a to, and we're going back to give our listeners the control. It's ask Arn almost anything for the month of March. We have a lot of questions for these and I can't wait, buddy. And, uh, I'm telling you, we still have so many leftover questions. We're going right into those for that next episode. It's one of my favorite arm that we do together. Okay. You got it, buddy. On behalf of Arn Anderson, this is Paul Bromwell and we'll see you right back here next week on ask Arn almost anything right here on Arn. <laughs>